My presentation will be on simplified unit testing with the EF Core in memory provider. So how many people here are fans of unit testing? Zero percent. No, maybe, maybe like 10 percent. How many people find unit testing easy? Zero percent. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here today is a simple way to do unit testing with the in-memory provider and I'm going to show you not only how to simplify your unit testing approach but also your overall solution architecture. I'm going to demonstrate some limitations and I'm also going to address some concerns that people raise when they, when they use this method. So by the end of tonight you will have both these capabilities. So hi, I'm Jason Taylor. I'm an SSW solution architect. I've been developing now since about 1994. In 1994, I got a Commodore 64 and I started programming with BASIC. A lot of people went from BASIC to Visual BASIC, not me. I found out that you could get games for the Commodore 64, so I played games until about 2001 and then .NET dropped in 2002 and so I started programming with .NET. So I've been doing that now for almost 17 years and uh, it's been great. Um, I don't think there's a more exciting time than right now with the release of .NET Core, the work that we're doing with single page applications. It's fantastic. Things are getting many times more complicated, but we're also finding ways to make them easier. And I hope tonight that I can show you some ways to make unit testing easier. You can reach me on Twitter at JasonGTAU or on my blog at codingflow.net. Let's get started. So the typical approach to unit testing plays out this way. First, we need to remove all dependencies on Entity Framework, which seems crazy, but that's the way it is. If we have a dependency on Entity Framework, that means that our unit tests are going to be making calls to external resources, and we can't do that. It'll slow our tests down, and really they'd be integration tests, not unit tests. The next thing we need to do is to implement abstractions. So a common abstraction is the unit of work and the repository. How many people here are implementing unit of work and repository right now? So yeah, about 50% about of the room. So, so there's a lot, a lot to be learned here. So we implement the unit of work and repository. Typically, we do it to create an abstraction layer between our database and the application that we're building. But Entity Framework already does that for us, so really the abstraction we're creating is an abstraction between our application and Entity Framework. So something to keep in mind. Then we need to create test doubles, so we've created all of these repositories, many, many repositories, and we've created a unit of work. And if we want to test those things, we need test doubles. Test doubles are basically pretend units of work and repositories, so they, they behave in a similar way to the object, but they're not the object itself. So when you do get to write in your unit tests, your tests won't be impacted by those dependencies. So this is a really tough process. Does anyone here enjoy writing unit tests in this way? No one, zero percent. So that, that's good. I'm, a, I'm of the same school of thought. And I think it's a big barrier for new people to unit testing. They have to learn all of this. And I think in many cases, it's impossible. And so we see a lot of people writing very few unit tests, if none at all. So let's have a look at the simplified approach. It's in complete contrast to the typical approach. In the simplified approach, we don't remove our dependencies on Entity Framework. We use the DB context directly in our application. So if we're using an ASP.NET MVC controller, we inject that directly into the controller and use it without any kind of abstraction whatsoever. So we don't implement abstractions. We don't need to uh, implement the unit of work or the repositories. And we don't need to create test doubles because we're going to use the DB context in our unit tests as well. But we're going to do this without actually calling any external resources. So this is, this is the demo that I'm going to do tonight. And um, let's get started. So first I'm going to show you the application that I've created to test. It's a simple to-do API. And I've created a controller, which is this items controller. You can see straight off the bat here that I have a to-do DB context, and that is the concrete context directly in the controller. And that gets injected using ASP.NET uh, MVC's dependency injection mechanisms. From here, it's very straightforward. We've got a number of methods, and they all use that DB context. So we've got context.items um, to list asynchronous. Uh, so that gets a collection of items, 
And then we have get by ID, get a specific item by its ID, create, um, check that the item's not null, check that the item's valid, add it to the collection and save the changes. Update, same sort of thing, we do our checks and balances and if we're all good, then we update the entity and we save our changes. And finally, delete. I'll stop there for a second. Is there any questions about this controller? No problem, it's pretty straightforward. One thing that I will say, while this controller is simple and straightforward, it is typical of the type of controllers we're creating today. We're doing a lot more work on the client side and so our controllers can be simple. So don't think of this as a simplified example. It is a real world example uh, in a simplified context. So let's have a look at the DB context. You can see here the constructor takes one argument, the DB context options, and that is used to configure the DB context. So in uh, the startup of this MVC application, you can see that we instantiate it as SQL Server, so it's using the SQL Server provider, and we pass in a connection string to do DB. So that's for the, the uh, for the MVC application. So you can see the connection string here. We're using local DB. There's not much more to the application than that. I've got a DB initializer here, um, and it's just responsible for seeding the database if there isn't any data. Let's have a look at the testing. The first thing that I should call out in relation to the testing, and this might be a little bit hard to see. I'll just drag this across if I can. There we go. So we're using Microsoft Entity Framework Core in memory. So that's the provider that we're gonna use for testing. On the uh, MVC application, the provider is SQL Server. So two separate providers. Everything else here, all other dependencies, are just for testing purposes. So you can see in this project, there's no connection string, there's no configuration of any kind. It's definitely not going out to external resources. So let's have a look at this first test controller. So I've got one test here, and it's testing the get all method. It's ensuring that it returns items. So as we saw, to construct the uh, to do DB context, we needed to pass it some options. We're using an options builder to construct those, and the only thing we're telling it to do is use the in-memory database. So in the ASP.NET Core application, we were telling it to use SQL Server. Here, we're telling it to use in-memory database. So you can see already why we're able to use that DB context in two different places. So we pass that into the constructor, and we have a newly instantiated context. Now, we do a little bit of uh, adding of some uh, sample items for testing here, save the changes, and we're ready to get to the real part of the test. So the real part of the test is here. We instantiate a new controller, pass in in the context. We then take an action. We say controller.getAll, which returns a result. We do some assertions on the result. So we assert that it is of collection type, uh, it is a collection of type I enumerable item, and there are 10 items uh, in that collection. So let's run that now. So <clears throat> that's finished and that passes. Uh, now I've got another test here and I'll uncomment it. And when we run this test, it's actually gonna fail. And let's have a look. So we'll run this. So it'll do a quick build and it'll pick up that test that I've just uncommented. There we go. So it says the assert.equal failed. It expected 11 items, but actually there were 21. And the reason for that is the way that we're instantiating this context, it's not providing us with a unique in-memory database for each test. So that's a problem. Now, if you read the Microsoft documentation, it will show you to do this. You basically spec specify a unique database name for every single test. And that's what I'm doing now. So I'm specifying the database name and I'm making it exactly the same as the test name. Now if I run that again, they're going to pass, which is, which is kind of good because now our tests don't have any side effects. But by the same token, it's also pretty terrible because it's a really messy way to write tests. 
We've essentially traded one form of complexity, mocking our unit of work in our repositories, with another form of complexity, this detailed construction of the context. So I didn't really like that. I had to dig around a little bit, but I did find a better method. Uh, so let's have a look at that now. So in this second test controller, we're using XUnit, and so I have a constructor, and I have implemented iDisposable, so I have a dispose method. So in the constructor, we instantiate the context every time for each test, and in the dispose method, we run that for each test. So if we've got 11 tests, the constructor is going to fire 11 times, and the dispose is going to fire 11 times. That's important. So the way that we construct the to-do uh, to DB context is we actually build our own service provider. And this service provider is responsible for providing a unique instance of the in-memory database each time it's requested. So that's the only difference here. We say, builder, build us a in-memory database and use this service provider. And that is the magic. Basically now, if we run, we'll need to comment, uncomment these tests. Whoops. Okay, so they're all ready to go. If we hit run all, those tests will pass and they'll run without side effects because uh, those tests are running in complete isolation. And you can see here that there's one test that's always quite slow, but everything else, and, and I say quite slow, it's, it's a half a second, everything else is quite fast. So generally around 10 to 20 milliseconds. So it's quite, it's quite efficient. Before we move on, are there any questions about this controller, these tests? Yes? Why, why are you implementing the iDisposable? OK, so um, the iDisposable. Is it really necessary? Uh, oh, that's a tough question. It's not really necessary for what we're doing. It, won't, it doesn't have any impact on the unique database. Um, what it does is just clean up our memory uh, as soon as we can. So the garbage collector could come along later and, and clean up these contacts. But if we're using that amount of memory, with the garbage collection firing so often, that could impact performance. So it's just best practice. You know, if you instantiate a context, uh, you dispose of it when you finish with it. So I think it's a, a good approach. Is it possible for you to, um, for you to use an unsupported link operator in your controller and then it'll work in the in the in the in memory provider if you're for this? It's possible, but we're not. We're not using the in-memory provider for integration tests. We're not testing the provider itself. We're testing the controller. So really what we're interested in is just the behavior of the controller. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, so at the moment for our, sorry, what was that? Yeah, so you're asking, um, do we normally inject the DB context in our production application straight into the controller? And do we normally have a layer in between? So yes, we do normally have a layer in between. Uh, typically, in this case, it would have been called the items logic. And that logic class would be what would have been injected into the controller. Uh, and the DB context would have been injected into the logic class. So that way, if we needed to use that logic, that business logic for another application, we could. It wouldn't be tightly coupled to uh, the controller. All right. Thank you. Let's continue. So what is the EF Core in-memory provider? So it's a database provider, just like the SQL Server provider or the Oracle provider. The difference is this one has been built for testing purposes. So you're not going to use it for production applications. Maybe you're thinking, I can use the in-memory provider so that I can have an ultra-fast uh, database in memory. It's not for that. It's for testing purposes. So it is in memory. Um, the advantage of that is there's no overhead of expensive I.O. operations and it's lightweight with minimal dependencies. Its dependencies are basically .NET standard and, of course, Entity Framework Core. There are some limitations to keep in mind. So in-memory is not a relational database provider, so you could actually run updates that would violate uh, referential integrity. Uh, however, for unit testing, this doesn't matter. As I mentioned, 
you're testing the system under test, so that might be a controller or a logic class. You're not testing the behavior of entity framework. So uh, often there are some concerns when I raise this method. And the first concern that's raised is you're writing integration tests, not unit tests. And I think I've shown here tonight that the tests that I were writing were testing the behavior of the controllers. They weren't testing the integration between the context and the controller. So I think it depends on how you write your test. Another point worth noting is in production, you're not going to be running in memory. So you can't do an integration test within memory. You'd have to do an integration test with a real live SQL Server database, ideally one that very, rep, uh, very closely represents production. The next one is this lack of isolation. So these tests are exercising code with dependencies on Entity Framework. And while that's correct, I'm OK with that. I trust Entity Framework in the same way that I trust the .NET Framework. I don't feel the need to isolate either of those for my tests. I just need to be careful that what I'm exercising is a behavior on the system under test. And finally, the unit of work and repository patterns are best practice. And that's true, they are. Uh, they're a great practice. And Entity Framework actually implements both of those patterns. The DB context is a unit of work and the DB set is a repository. I don't think there's a need to recreate these patterns for this for in, in relation to unit testing. I think Entity Framework does a pretty good job. So here's some resources for you to get started. As I mentioned, there's some Microsoft documentation and there's testing within memory. So this will give you all of the basics. Uh, however, as I, as I did mention in the demonstration, they specify to use the database name. And it's definitely better to use an internal service provider. So uh, keep an eye on my blog, codingflow.net. And I'll post a, um, an article on this shortly so that you can uh, have access to the source code and this information. The next resource is a uh, Entity Framework core database, which I built. It's the Northwind Traders version. This version is code first. It's fully seeded, and it's cross-platform. Uh, I'm pretty vanilla, so I've tried it on Windows and SQL Server. Uh, but Brendan from SSW has tried it on Linux and Postgres SQL, um, and he said it's working quite well. So if you're looking for a database that you can test with, this is a good choice. And finally, we've got the .NET Core Dev Superpowers coming up at the end of July. So it'll be in Sydney on the 27th. It's a full day event. It's $49. And in that event, we'll teach you everything you need to know to get up and running with the .NET Core stack. So in summary tonight, there's a few key points that I'd like you to take away. It's that you don't need to remove your dependencies on Entity Framework. You can use the DB context directly. You don't need to implement abstractions. Entity Framework has already implemented the unit of work and the repository, and they've done a pretty good job. You don't need to create test doubles. You can inject your DB context into your controllers, and therefore you can use your DB context in your unit tests. Uh, if you've got a method for seeding your DB context in development, you can reuse that method for seeding your DB context in testing. So you get, you get a little bit of reuse there, which is nice. And that only leaves us with one thing, just writing the unit tests. Thank you. <laughs>